and welcome back to Susty Talk. That's Edie's video series designed to keep us all feeling connected while we are working remotely or on furlough or just in a way that is a little bit different from usual. Um, thank you so much for tuning in to this latest episode and I'm delighted to be on the call today with Ian Howe from Unilever um, who heads up research and development, um, research and development, sorry, at the home care um, division. How are you Ian? I'm good thank you, yep pleased to meet you. Um, and I think that as we've just mentioned off the call it's your first time coming on to a ED interview right? Absolutely, yeah, so uh, bear with me. <laughs> I'll do my very best. <laughs> well, we're delighted to have you on, but I think for the benefit of people listening, it would be great to hear a bit more about um, about your role at Unilever and how that fits within the wider R&D and sustainability agenda there. Yeah, so, um, so first of all, I'm a, um, who am I? I'm a materials I'm a scientist, I'm a physicist. I work in the home care division, as you said, of Unilever, and I work in the R&D function. Um, and the team I'm in is called Science and Technology. So we sit at the front end of the research and development function. Um, so that's kind of the boring way of describing what <laughs> I do. And that shows you where I sit. Our remit, if you like, is to inspire our division with new innovation opportunities. So that's kind of the cool way of saying what we do. And it really is about, we look at science and technology as it's emerging and we inspire the whole division with kind of what's possible and how things could be different. Um, mm -hmm. And so over the last 18 months, that's how we've arrived at sort of the Clean Futures agenda. It's very much looking at emerging science, emerging societal trends, and then putting out this big, bold thought. Um, and we've worked with procurement, we've worked with R&D, we've worked with finance, our legal teams. It really has captured everybody. Um, so it's a true kind of living, inspirational purpose of Unilever. So that's what I do, um, mm -hmm. that's where I sit. And I'm presuming that working must have looked a bit different for you over the past few months. Yeah, so it's interesting. So, I mean, I spent all my time now sitting in front of this thing. Um, I'm lucky because I do have a lab based team as well and they're able to get into the labs and do work. Um, so I spend one day a week in the laboratories supervising and making sure everything's done safely. Um, but yeah, lots and lots of um, teams meetings. Um, so, yeah, that's quite different. Of course, but as you say, you've still been really busy and managed to drive a lot of this agenda forward. And we're on this call as part of this Clean Futures agenda that you alluded to. Um, there's been a commitment made to remove fossil fuel based carbon from cleaning and laundry products by 2030, which we've covered on our site. And I'm sure that a lot of people will have seen. But I, for one, I didn't even know, for example, that there were fossil fuels in my laundry capsules. Um, so it'd be good to hear a bit more about why why these materials are so widely used in the first place, because like plastics, there's a reason that they were used yeah. um, in the first place. And whether I'm just being daft or whether you think people in general were aware of of this. No. So, so yeah, so it's a good it's a really good question. So um, a little bit of the background. So, so what is a sort of detergent? What's a home care cleaning product and why, why are these materials there in the first place? So. And essentially the biggest thing that we put into a detergent, and this is across the industry, and it's true for cleaning products in home care, it's true for shampoos, are things called surfactants. That's that's the thing that gets your clothes clean when you put it in a washing machine or when you're cleaning a surface. And those surfactants, they're um, getting a little bit technical. They're quite small molecules, but they have, as part of the molecule, they've got this thing called a hydrocarbon chain or an alkane. So that's quite technical. But that alkane is basically the thing that you either extract from a seed oil. So you'll you'll hear about sort of plant based materials and that's right. kind of coconut oils and, and that kind of stuff. But the other place you can get it is from um, from fossil fuels, which if you think about it a long time ago were plants. Um, so, so these surfactants which make up the bulk of cleaning chemicals can be derived from anywhere that you can get these sort of hydrocarbons as they're called from and they come from oil whether that be a natural oil or a fossil oil so so that's why they're there and that's what they do um and, and that's why they're kind of ubiquitous across across the industry um so they're called fossil fuels but actually it's, it's not like you've got petrol there it's of course it's, it's just a link back to fossil carbon is where that sort of terminology comes from mm -hmm. 
and do you think that people are aware of this so I've seen so many campaigns about washing on lower temperatures or washing less frequently for example but I've I've never actually seen a campaign about this before no I mean I think that there are probably some consumers who are, are kind of aware of what's going on and how the chemistry works but it is quite deep <laughs> relatively deep chemistry so I, I suspect most people don't know they, they may be aware of surfactants and soap and that kind of stuff but the kind of where all that came from and where it starts in the sort of chemical supply chain, I suspect not. I think mm -hmm. most people don't don't know. Mm -hmm. Of course, and you can't simply get rid of the material, as you say. It's the thing that cleans the thing that people are trying to clean. Um, so you're going to need to look for alternative um, sources. And in order to categorise them, I understand there's a new sourcing tool and um, system called the Carbon Rainbow. So what? colours of carbon are on that and where do where do they come from? Yeah you're right so absolutely so people talk about decarbonising and, and particularly in the fuel in the fuel world people talk about decarbonising energy and switching from um, sort of fossil fuel derived energy to green electric and wind power but you're right you can't as a factor as a factor and it is a material and it has to have carbon in it from somewhere so we started looking about 18 months ago to say well if it's not going to be what we call black carbon um, where else could this carbon come from? And, and you look around and you say, well, it could come from C1 utilisation of so carbon dioxide in the air. That's carbon. We could use that. Um, it comes from plants. It, you could recycle carbon from plastic. We found that got to be a very technical conversation very quickly. Um, and when we were talking to people across the business in finance and procurement in marketing, it, it became a very long protracted conversation. So very quickly for shorthand, we started putting labels and now clearly Black carbon is easy. Everybody's always called fossil carbon black. Green carbon for plants is easy. And that terminology just carried on. So we have um, we have uh, green carbon, which is plant based materials and, and fermentation is now becoming. So if you think about alcohol from fermentation, which most people know that comes from plant based sources. That's green carbon as well. Um, we have purple carbon. So that's where you take um, in essence, carbon dioxide. So it could be what people know about these days, direct air capture um, and turning that into chemicals. It could be taking effluent from a steel works or a, a cement works and turning that into chemicals. It could be methane capture. So that's a purple carbon, turning it into, into chemicals. Um, you can recycle plastic. So people know a lot about recycling plastic through um, post-consumer recycling, mechanical recycling, but you can chemically recycle it. So we call that gray. Um, because the plastic is made from carbon, which once was fossil fuel. So there's a little bit of a link to black, but because you're going to reuse it, we just thought it was nice to call it gray. So it wasn't quite, quite as black. Um, we have blue carbon. So blue carbon is, it's light green, but it's marine based. So right. rather than being land based, we think about, well, yep, you can get carbon from the oceans as well. So we could use that. Um, so they're the main ones. And then there's some mixtures of those, which we call brown. Um, because that's just you know, if you've mixed colours together, you get brown. So, uh, mm -hmm. so those um, are the main colours. Mm -hmm. And which are you seeing sort of being the easiest to get a hold of and implement in the short term? Because some of those, as you say, sound pretty technical. And I've never heard of a product made with sort of marine carbon, for for example. So I'm imagining that that's a little way off. It's interesting, actually. So there are. Um, so you can get some polymers from, for example, seaweed extracts, mm -hmm. and those polymers might get used to make films like your, your capsules for your laundry detergents. They could come from um, from seaweed derived. So that would be an example of blue. But yeah, at, at big volume. So when we go back to the surfactants we were talking about, um, I think grey is probably the nearest. Um, the sort of recycling of plastics back into chemicals that's quite well established now or is beginning to get well established in the, in sort of the chemical industry um, but purple is there as well you can buy ethanol uh, which is from CO2 utilization in parts of the world um, and from ethanol if you can make ethanol you can make anything in principle um, so the chemicals are coming but at scale I think probably um, green obviously is there by the industrial by technology that's already very well advanced um, Following on from green, then grey is the is the next one that's coming um, mm -hmm. in terms of sort of time to market. Mm -hmm. And obviously Unilever can help scale that up by putting demand on and I'm assuming that other businesses can do the same. But is there a role here for 
business collaboration or for policies to help with scale, scaling up some of these ingredients too? Yeah, no, absolutely both of those. So I mean, we're not a chemicals company. So as you say, we can put demand, but we don't make chemicals. So absolutely there's a role for our partners. Uh, they could be new partners um, because some of these technologies are incredibly new, as you described. Mm -hmm. But actually what we see is we've been talking to our sort of incumbent partner base for 12 months or so now around this topic. Um, and they're all over it. They, they absolutely buy the sort of what we call the carbon rainbow journey. They're all working through how they can transform their own sort of um, feedstocks into this future world. Um, they're all at different time scales and different places, but they've absolutely got a role to play. Um, so definitely companies and other businesses um, and sort of businesses feeding businesses. When you start to un uncouple the petrochemical supply chain, you realise it's incredibly complicated with people feeding other people, feeding other people, um, and that's all got to unlock um, and change. Um, and then, but as you say, also policy and regulation. So, um, and it's an obvious one to say, but fair carbon pricing, um, regulations around waste, if we're talking about chemical recycling of plastics, all of that needs to be encouraged through policy. Um, so, for example, in the EU, making sure we've got sort of renewable carbon at the centre of European policy to make all of these things work and encourage the right behaviours. Absolutely, that's a role to play as well. So, yeah, it's a definite call to arms for, um, for everybody to help and support, um, even competitors, dare I say. <laughs> <laughs> and you talked a bit how you'd have to work with procurement and how there's like a demand and a supply piece obviously it touches all parts of the business but I think we haven't touched so much on manufacturing so a lot of the time when we get um when we get an announcement we then get an announcement a few months later saying oh we've invested x in new manufacturing education um or equipment so what does your work look like at the moment with with that that side of the business yeah no it's interesting so um in, in one sense it's business as usual because we're always evolving our products and developing new materials so the fact that we're now looking to do um sort of different carbon from our point of view in unilever what we do is we're still formulating products just the same as ever so in one sense it's business as usual um on the other hand what we see is um we're going to be using slightly different balances of ingredients. So there's a principle we call eco design, which is it's about concentrating products or compacting products. That will lead to some changes in in the way that we make things. Um, the biggest change I think is is downstream. It's in the operations of the people that supply us. Um, so if you're switching from a, I've got a factory which has a pipeline bringing in a million tons of crude oil a day, and now you're switching to a feedstock which is um, recycle plastic waste that's a big shift um, mm -hmm. so i think it's there that we're going to sort of need the investments in manufacturing rather than in sort of um rather than in unilever operations there's also the whole clean energy piece that the energy of production needs to change as well so unilever's already moved on its own operations um, to switch to sort of clean energy but we also need our suppliers who are making the chemicals using energy to really sort of push their transformation of that energy agenda as well so, mm -hmm. so there's that change in the, the way in which the feedstocks arrive, but also the energy used to do the manufacture um, that feeds us. So, yeah, lots of change. Mm -hmm. I can imagine that's a big priority for a lot of businesses, though, just purely because of COVID. Yes, no, absolutely. Yeah, no, definitely. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, Ian, I think that's all the questions that we have time for today. So thank you so much for taking the time out, out of your day. I know you must be super busy. <laughs> No, that's fine. It was great. Thank you. <laughs> Good to catch up with you. And for everyone listening, just a reminder that you can access this episode and all of our other Susty Talk episodes via our website or via our YouTube. And we will be bringing you a new episode at least once a week, um, regardless of what Boris Johnson decides that he wants to do this week or next or the week after that. Um, but in the meantime, thank you so much for listening. Um, stay safe, stay well and keep up the sussy talk. And it's a goodbye from myself and goodbye from Ian. Bye.